All righty. Well, again, I want to thank everybody this evening for joining us for the December uh, members meeting and speaker series with Western Cuyahoga Audubon. I'm Nancy Howell, one of the board members, and we've got well, plenty of announcements to make. So um, here we go. Um, I do want to mention that we uh, all we run on our memberships for Western Cuyahoga, so we would like for those who have been members to renew, and if you know somebody who is interested in attending our programs through Zoom or our bird walks, Christmas bird count, whatever, find those new members too, and it's simple. Just go to our website, www.wcaudubon.org, and click on the membership button. So we will be glad to have you as a member, and we'd love to have your involvement too. Speaking of the Christmas bird count, the west side of Cleveland, which is our Lakewood Circle Christmas bird count, is on Friday, December 30th. Now, a lot of people will kind of, ah, they throw up their hands, oh, Friday. Well, I didn't really want to have it on the Christmas weekend, nor on the New Year's weekend. So Friday was the best day um, I could think of for perhaps people taking a little time off from work, uh, half a day, whatever, maybe all day, and participate. Again, there's a lot of information on our website, on the Christmas bird count, how to sign up. Uh, how to participate, and we are going to be having a pre-Christmas bird count kickoff, and I'll be talking about that in just a little bit. Now, besides our, our regular newsletter that is printed four times a year quarterly, we also have an e-newsletter which comes out weekly, and you have, do have to sign up for it. Uh, again, you can see there's uh, HTTPS, www.wcaudubon.org slash newsletter sign up dot html that e-newsletter arrives weekly generally on a tuesday and through mailchimp and it reminds people about events that are just are coming up programs sometimes things happen very quickly we get a little bit of information and um, we want to get it up out to our our members and those who have signed up so uh, this is the way we get our most updated information out to you quickly. Um, if you feel like it's you're getting a little bit too much information, you can un unsubscribe at any time. There you go. Thanks. Christmas bird count 2022. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Friday, December 30th is the actual count, but we are having a Zoom, a virtual pre-Christmas bird count kickoff, boy, that's hard to say, on Monday, December 12th, starting at 7. Um, what we'll do uh, during that kickoff, we'll talk about our count circle, we'll discuss the areas that still need to be covered, um, how to turn in data, um, we'll just cover a lot of information and we will even have some bird identification reviews for some who might be a little bit newer at birding and want to know the difference between a house finch and a purple finch, um, some things like that. So um, new birders, seasoned participants are always, always welcome. And then of course, uh, this year we are going to be having our Christmas bird count dinner and wrap up on the evening of Friday, December 30th at the Rocky River Nature Center. And the, there will be a dinner that we will be providing. Um, and the only thing we ask you to do is enjoy, come along, bring, bring dessert perhaps if you have some to share. And uh, we'll have a great time going over our checklist, our initial checklist, and just seeing what people had to, to see that day. So should be a lot of fun. All righty, Michelle uh, is our field trip co-coordinator and has a lot of information for us this evening. All right, thanks, Nancy. Hello, everyone. Uh, next slide, please. 
All right, so I'm going to cover our upcoming second Saturday bird walk, our holiday raffle, and how you can connect with us on social media. Uh, next slide. All right, so please join us the second Saturday of every month for our second Saturday bird walk. The next one is on December 10th at 9 a.m. at the Rocky River Nature Center. We meet between the upper and lower parking lots and then take a few hours to walk the Nature Center trails. Bill Dunninger, Dave Grasskemper, Ken Gober, and Al Rand are our leaders for the walk. Last year in December, we saw a pair of pileated woodpeckers three brown creepers, eight Carolina wren, two barred owls, and a red-tailed hawk that caught a vole and landed on a branch very close to the birding group. Uh, join us this Saturday to see what December has in store for us this year. Next slide, please. All right, this past second Saturday was held on November 12th, and here is Bill Dininger's report. He says, the November 2022 second Saturday of the month bird walk started with temperatures at 39 degrees and also ended at 39 degrees. It was cloudy all morning. There were 17 observers and we saw 29 species. The expected species were noted. Black capped chickadees, tufted titmouse, house finch, and American goldfinch were present in large numbers. We were fortunate to see two separate groups of bluebirds, each with five birds chasing and flitting about. Tree sparrows and juncos are back in town. The resident barred owl made an appearance. Next slide, please. All right, so WCAS received very charitable donations of new and like new holiday decorations and other festive items to help some lucky participants get into the holiday spirit and for a good cause. Uh, participation in this raffle raised $90 and then the WCAS board committed to matching. So that's a total of $180 that was raised to help fund a scholarship for a youth and or educator to meet their needs in connecting with nature, whether that be a camp experience, continuing, continuing education, education requirement or tools to use in the field, such as binoculars. As you see here, um, Marini Lynn is the winner of two baskets. Heather Risher will get to take home the Disney basket. Uh, we had several interested in the Owl About the Holidays basket, and so we will have the live drawing for the winner right now. Um, so I have tickets in this hat. This is the hat that I hike and bird with. Um, so let me just shake this up really good. I know my stick in this approach and like, like, oh, that's such a sad. All right. And the winner is Michelle Manzo. So you don't need to be present to have one, but congratulations to Michelle Manzo. Yeah, I don't think Michelle's present, but congratulations, Michelle. Yes. And to all the holiday raffle winners. There's there's still some more things too, and we'll have them out at the Christmas bird count dinner uh, for you to peruse through and perhaps give us a donation. All right, next slide. All right, finally, uh, please stay connected with us in between our virtual and in-person activities by following us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Be sure to use hashtag WC Audubon when you post a bird photo on Instagram for a chance to be featured on our Instagram page. If selected, I will reach out to you with details. Also, many of our virtual programs are recorded like this speaker series meeting and can be found on our WC Audubon YouTube channel, so be sure to subscribe. I believe that's it for me. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, Michelle. Appreciate it a lot. Um, do a lot for us. And this has been wonderful. Plus, I hope everybody noticed those lovely slides that Michelle puts in there. These are the photos she's taken. And she is in a photo show uh, at West Woods uh, Nature Center uh, in uh, the Geauga County Park District, no less. So she has some lovely photos there along with two other uh, lady photographers. Thank you for that plug, Nancy. Appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> All righty. Hi, Drina. Are you here today? I sure am. Good evening, oh. everybody. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about our third season of our book club. And our themes this season are climate change, adaptation, migration, and then we have a unique species study, and it's the misunderstood pigeon. Next slide, please. We generally meet on the third Tuesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. on Zoom, and uh, <laughs> due to a scheduling conflict, we will not be on the third Tuesday in January, but the fifth, 
So that's January 31st at 7 p.m. And then the third Tuesday in April is uh, April 18th. Next slide, please. So this book is really, really something. A Pocket Guide to Pigeon Watching, Getting to Know the World's Most Misunderstood Bird. And I have to say, I'm having an attitude change as I read this book. It is part field guide, part history, part ornithology primer, and altogether it is fun, really fun. Next slide, please. So Rosemary Moscow, the author, uh, was able to uh, bring together both of her major interests in life, which are art and cartooning, and also then to be a science communicator. And so this is well demonstrated in, in this book. This first slide, she's just showing us how pigeons and doves are really the exact same species. And then she demonstrates here how she's going to uh, introduce us to uh, pigeonology. Next slide, please. I also want to uh, uh, say something about the environment of the America's Book Club because it is such a good book club. They generally meet the third Thursdays of the month, but because of Thanksgiving um, this past month, and then also coming up with all the holidays, uh, the meeting uh, for December was on December 1st, last Thursday, and I'm including it and mentioning it here because it was such a good book club discussion and introduced me to somebody I wish I had heard of before, this author, Steve Burroughs, who's the Canadian uh, writer, and he has a series. This is the, the ninth one I understand is coming out this summer. This is a series of birder mysteries. Um, the detective is a bird watcher. And much of the time he'd rather be bird watching than being a detective. So Steve Burroughs, I'm hoping, um, um, I, I've been really pretty good all year. So Santa Claus should bring this. So next slide, please. And then uh, I also like to bring up the Ur Urban Birder series of, it's called uh, In Conservation With. And um, David Lindo, who has been our guest at um, Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society, uh, he has quite a few sessions. Um, there's two in December, one was last evening and then the 12th. But in January, there are several, uh, 9th, the 12th, 19th, 23rd, 26th, and 31st, all with really interesting topics coming up. They're not all bird discussion, book discussions, excuse me. But I have a couple um, web addresses here, uh, one for the Urban Birder um, website, but then there's a, a delightful interview with Rosemary Moscow, the author of the book. It's a wonderful interview and uh, it really gives a wonderful uh, look at the book to her book. And then I discovered uh, an interview that David Lindo had with Jen Rumfield and maybe some of you have seen this, but this is a really a, a beautiful, wonderful interview with such an outstanding birder here right from Cleveland, right from the Rocky River Nature Center. So um, next slide, please. So this is our series for the year. Um, we did hurricane lizards and plastic squid in October. And if any of you are looking for ideas for Christmas present for your climate change, uh, nature interested person, that's a wonderful book. And then in April, we'll be uh, reading and discussing the bestseller, the New York Times bestseller, uh, a wing, a, The World on the Wing by Scott Widensall. Hope you can join us. Thanks so much, Drina. There, boy, there's a lot of good books out there, a lot of great books out there. And for those who are watching or listening, um, you know, we do like to get ideas as well. So if you have a thought as to a book that you've read that you highly recommend, um, as you can see, it's not just birds, it's nature-oriented, it's climate change, it's there's a lot of things that we can cover. 
that uh, information can be sent to info at wcaudubon.org and we will be happy to, to look into it. I should Thanks have mentioned again. too, uh, Nancy, sorry, but um, right. the books are all available at libraries. So if you uh, wanna get a copy from the library, electronic or a hard copy. Thank you. Thanks again, Drina. Always, always fun to have you on. All righty, Marianne Romito, our Climate Watch Coordinator for Northeast Ohio. Marianne, how are you this evening? Oh, I'm just ducky. <laughs> um, um, next slide, slide, please. I just wanna let, you, let everybody here know that we're going to, we, that Audubon has a new program called Climate Watch. And it, um, next slide, it, please. It takes, oops, it takes place between January 15th and February 15th. But the Audubon board has decided that we try to like, try to make this a group effort so that everybody who wants to get involved, we, we'd all like to try to do it on the same day. So we've just selected Janu Saturday, January, and I forget which day it was already, January the 21st. So if you, and next slide, please. Um, if you'd like to know more about this, you can watch the video. I, I put on a program last month, and this is the link. Can, can we copy and paste this and put this into the, well, on the bottom of that slide, Nancy, I had copied this link. Could you copy and paste it into the chat for me? Yeah, I don't know if I can do that or not. Okay. But since it's such an odd, odd name, um, it explains. Oops. Sorry. It no, explains I can't do that right now. Okay. Well, we'll try to do that later. Let's see if I can. No. No, I can't do it either. Um, it the, the video goes into what the what Climate Watch is and why we're doing it and how to conduct a survey and how to report the data. And and it's pretty simple. So I I hope that a lot of people will will watch that. And if you decide you want to participate, please contact me. There's my email right there and my phone number, depending on which one you want to do. I don't care. Um, and keep the keep the date in mind that of January, Saturday, January 21st. Yeah, it's really very simple. So those of you who would like to participate, it, it only takes part of one day. You know, you don't have to take a whole lot of time. There's some target species that we'll be looking for, and um, it sounds like it's a you know very easy. And then we'll help National Audubon uh, with data um, as far as how birds are bird numbers are changing because of, of climate change, because of habitat changes as well too. And so this is a bit be a long term study, but we hope that you can it's participate. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Marianne. Appreciate it. <clears throat> um, Amanda Sobrowski, I don't know if Amanda was able to join us this evening. I did not see her on the list. Amanda, are you there? Well, Amanda is our <clears throat> coffee coordinator, and we uh, are Western Cuyahoga Audubon on our website sells Birds and Beans Coffee, which is the only brand that is Smithsonian certified bird friendly, fair trade, organic. Um, the forests down in Central and South America are not clear cut, so it leaves habitat for uh, not only the native birds, but think about where our, many of our neotropical migrants go in the wintertime, down to those very same habitats. So, and it also ensures that the farmers do make a living wage. So really, it is a win, 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 win situation for the people, the land, the wildlife, and for those of you who are coffee drinkers. Um, the order can be done through the uh, Western Cuyahoga Audubon homepage. There is a coffee club uh, button. The or next order is going to be placed on January 10th. So please get your order in before that time. We only order quarterly. So the next order uh, will be placed in April. 
So you don't want to run out of coffee during the winter time. So really stock up now. It'll help you get through the winter time. And again, Jan, before January 20th, get those, get the coffee orders in. Uh, the more orders we get, we don't have to pay for shipping. We don't want to pass the, any shipping uh, along to our, our coffee drinkers either. So we hope to hear from you about that. All righty, um, January, yep, just about a month away or so, uh, we have one of our own, um, one of our WCES board members, Michelle Brocious, who you heard speak a little earlier. She is also our field trip coordinator and a fantastic bird photographer. And she is going to be sharing uh, her bird photographs with us. Uh, exploring nature through a lens. And it may not just be all birds, it may be some other things as well too. So I hope that you can join us in January, which is Tuesday, January 3rd. Again, we'll have our announcements at 7.30 and then our presentation will begin around eight o'clock. So we hope that you can join us for that. But I know this evening you've all been waiting for uh, the December speakers. Dan Best, uh, a retired Geauga Park naturalist, and Rachel McKinney, an educator, going for the gold, three decades of orthonotary warbler husbandry. I can't wait. Uh, I, I think a lot of you have perhaps seen orthonotary warblers, the, the golden swamp warbler, but I just can't wait for this. But I just want to tell you a little bit about uh, our presenters, Dan. Uh, of Chardon in Geauga County as a lifelong student of local ecology, a nature educator with over 40 years of experience in interpreting Northeast Ohio natural history and related cultural history that included almost 33 years with the Geauga Park District. I like the photograph because uh, as you can see, Dan is being supervised very, very carefully by, uh, by his dog. I, I can't remember your dog's name, but I'm sure you'll let us know. And then Rachel McKinney uh, of Huntsburg in Geauga County is a naturalist with over 20 years experience as a science, mathematics, and environmental educator at Andrews Osborne Academy in Willoughby. She has been a partner in the Upper Cuyahoga River Prothonotary Warbler Nesting Project for 12 years. And again, the beautiful photograph that was sent, here's Rachel smiling. You can obviously see it's probably a very damp day, but um, she's ready to be out there. She's got her waterproof gear on and ready to get those prothonotary warbler boxes out. And I don't wanna take up much more time, but I do wanna introduce Dan Best and Rachel McKinney. I am going to be stopped sharing and hopefully that'll come off. Stop share, please. And then Dan will take over. Um, let's see here. Yeah. Is everybody seeing this? Hang on, I gotta get it up on slideshow. How's that looking? It looks good to me. Okay. Well, all right. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Nancy. Um, yeah, Eddie the dog somewhere, but uh, <laughs> anyway. So yeah, let us let us begin here. Um, and Rachel, you're there, right? Somewhere. I'm here. Okay. All right. Okay. So um, yeah. We could, yeah, 30 years of prothonotary warbler husbandry, couldn't think of a better word uh, for what we are doing, uh, increasing the nesting success of prothonotary warblers. Um, an alternate title might be uh, Three Decades of Prowling. P-R-O-W is the uh, American Ornithological Society's four-letter alpha code for prothonotary warblers. So we are Therefore, those who work with prothonotary warblers are therefore prowlers. So uh, anyway, um, the uh, prothonotary warbler, and we'll refer to them as prothonotaries, it's a long name, uh, are, they're admired and eloquently uh, described for their intense 
it's like an egg yolk yellow color that the males have. Um, females slightly less dazzling as are the uh, young birds following their post juvenile molt uh, and they come soon after fledging. So there they are. And uh, now prothonotaries are the only cavity nesting warblers in Eastern North America. The only other one uh, is Lucy's warbler of the West. And um, like bluebirds and tree swallows and house wrens and uh, gray crested flycatchers and tufted titmice, and white breasted nuthatches, and the list goes on. They are considered secondary nesters in that they don't make their own cavities, but they use a variety of uh, cavities, either those that are uh, abandoned woodpecker uh, nest cavities or the, the uh, knot holes and uh, hollows you get when a branch snaps off and that kind of thing uh, that uh, present themselves. Um, so uh, yeah, that's what they use, cavity nesters, secondary cavity nesters. So um, tolerant of humans, these uh, very adaptable birds, um, readily use nest boxes and have been demonstrating using an astounding variety of unnatural cavities, uh, even entering buildings, not unlike Carolina wrens, to use minnow buckets, glass jars, coat pockets, shoes, toolboxes, and, and an absolutely laughable list goes on. Not, yeah, and like Carolina wrens, house wrens, um, that uh, entering structures to make use of whatever fills the bill, pardon the pun, for a nesting structure. So, um, so what, what's this name prothonotary come from? Well, if you go across the state line into Pennsylvania during the election season, you're gonna see signs for people running for the public office of prothonotary. So in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, it's about the only state left that still has um, this position. It's essentially a clerk of courts, but it handles the non-criminal court records and, and filings and that. So therefore that's prothonotary, but that's not where the name comes from for, for the birds. Um, most uh, references uh, ascribe the name prothonotary to the Vatican administrators of the Roman Catholic Church who wore these bright yellow hoods or robes. Um, and um, so, and that goes back to like the mid 1800s. And it's just a really fuzzy history of how that got started. And looking into it deeper, you know, you start to get into um, the possibility of it rather being ascribed to the uh, Byzantine Empire or the Roman Empire or whatever, but um, most references, again, will ascribe it to the, um, to the, uh, the Vatican. And uh, so where did that come from? Well, again, it's uh, is maybe from the French Creole population, who is largely Catholic of Louisiana, for which this bird was a was a neighbor. Uh, so I'm still looking into that and uh, hopefully we'll have, get that cleared up. But anyway, so um, I prefer this name and I wish, and I think we're going to uh, uh, have uh, the Blackbrook and Audubon Society, the Black River Audubon Society, the uh, Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society, the Audubon Society, Greater Cleveland, get together and petition the American Ornithological Society to rename this bird, the Golden Swamp Warbler, which is an old fashioned name for this that perfectly describes the appearance and the habitat of this bird. A lot simpler rather than have to explain medieval history to people in accounting for this bird's name. However, the uh, Latin name or the, the species name Citria that's a no-brainer because of the bright yellow color resembles a citrus like a grapefruit uh, or a lemon. So, um, okay. Well, um, like other famous denizens of dismal wetlands, prothonotary, they are habitat specialists and they are restricted to swamps. That is wetlands dominated by trees and or shrubs growing in or at the edge of standing water. 
Prothonotaries even were known as swamp canaries down in the deep south. So, as uh, swamp dwellers, prothonotaries find their main habitat in the river bottomland forests of rivers and swamplands, the bayous, if you will, of the southern states. The northern reaches of their Prothon uh, the prothonotaries breeding range extend into the southern Great Lakes region where wherever or, uh, true swamp habitat occurs, which as you know, Ohio having lost 95% of its wetlands um, means that uh, the prospects for prothonotary are pretty limited. However, um, and I'll interject here to say that um, uh, prothonotary warblers are federally listed as endangered species in Canada. Small tenuous populations of prothonotaries are found in Ontario, mostly in patches of swamp found on the peninsulas, the sand spits uh, jutting out uh, from the northern shore of Lake Erie. Now, the Canadian prothonotaries are threatened with habitat destruction through coastal development and agriculture, and especially in recent years by rising lake levels that inundate the remaining swamp habitat that's found on these little peninsulas and sand spits. As migratory songbirds, specifically neotropical migratory songbirds who make their home in both the Northern and Southern hemisphere, uh, prothonotaries winter in Mexico, Central America, and Northern South America. Coastal mangrove swamps have uh, uh, considered, that's considered the, the essential winter habitat for prothonotaries. And mangroves, as you may know, are globally threatened habitats declining due to coastal development and aquaculture further threatened with rising sea levels due to climate change. So um, Dr. Chris Tanra of the, the Ohio State University and his graduate students have been using geolocators attached to um, prothonotaries to track their migratory travels. Uh, geolocators um, are revolutionizing. Um, they will, um, I think eventually make bird banding obsolete because you get so much more information from them. And that's a whole nother discussion, but um, I, they have determined that a, a key wintering destination for Ohio's prothonotaries, and this is based on a large population of prothonotary warblers at um, uh, Hoover Reservoir in Delaware County. Anyway, um, they are, uh, it looks to me, uh, they have found that the forest along the, the Magdalena River Valley in Northern Columbia is a key wintering spot. And so following years of warfare between government forces and rebel guerrillas, this region is now threatened with deforestation as settlers clear previously vacant land for farming. So um, prothonotaries have a really interesting history in Ohio. Uh, they were first uh, described or found in the 1850s, and they were colonizing um, the swampy margins of the canal lakes, places like Grand Lake, St. Mary's, and Buckeye Lake, and uh, naturally occurring lakes that were enlarged uh, to provide a steady source of water for Ohio's canal system back in the uh, early to mid 1800s. And uh, so that was the initial spot for, hey, there you go. First reported in 1862 at Canal Feeder Lakes. Okay. Well, um, so by the early decades of the 20th century, these lake margins were developed on, the, on these canal lakes uh, for amusement parks and for boat yards and for cottages and even amusement parks. So, um, that habitat was, yeah, was being degraded. However, at the same time, and again, this is uh, remarkable how adaptable these birds are as far as pioneers to newly available habitat. But then the great flood of 2013, where just about every river in both the Lake Erie and Ohio River drainage in Ohio flooded, um, been nothing like it since. And that brought about the flood control acts of the early 20th century that resulted in a lot of dam building and reservoir building. And two examples I can point to as a result of that being the Mosquito Creek Lake 
uh, in uh, Trumbull County, which is administered by the Army Corps of Engineers and the Miami Watershed Conservancy dams. So again, you get the same place. When they flood this area, you end up with swampy margins and uh, that is um, habitat. These birds take advantage of that, move right in. And uh, in the latter decades of the 20th century, reservoirs were built to supply water to growing populations, especially Columbus area. And most notably uh, with the creation of Hoover Reservoir and Elm Creek Lake, both in Delaware County, north of Columbus. And again, these have provided, matter of fact, there's some large populations of prothonotaries at those reservoirs. And with the, uh, the beaver having uh, made their comeback in since about 19, late 60s, early 70s and since in Ohio, they uh, beaver uh, creating wetlands, again, drowns trees and provides opportunities for, well, woodpeckers and then cavities. Um, the cavities that follow the nesting cavities. As a matter of fact, if you have an edition of the first Ohio Breeding Bird Atlas, you'll see the cover art features prothonotary warbler nesting in a woodpecker cavity in a dead tree in a, a beaver wetland. So um, yeah, and this would be like the uh, beaver marsh, the Ira Road beaver marsh down at uh, Cuyahoga Valley National Park is being an example. They have prothonotaries there. So Ohio's uh, prothonotaries are are not uniformly distributed across Ohio. Again, being swamp nesters, they are, uh, they are opportunists, but they are restricted to swamp habitats. I get uh, questions from people, well, I have a pond in my yard. If I put out an S box by the pond, well, I get prothonotaries like, well, you might get tree swallows, but, um, but no, they're not uh, pond nesters per se, they are swamp nesters. So, um, the main population centers would be the Lake Erie Marshes in Lucas, Ottawa, Erie and Sandusky counties, including McGee Marsh, Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge. If you go up there uh, to McGee Marsh during the greatest week in American birding, um, you'll see prothonotaries there. And um, Elm Creek uh, Lake in Delaware County, we meant, just mentioned that. Uh, that's where Dick Tuttle formerly, Dick Tuttle rest his in peace. He passed away this past year. Um, his prothonotary nesting project was there. Where in, uh, also in, again, Delaware County, the Hoover Reservoir, that's where Charlie Bombasi has had for many years a large scale nest box program for prothonotaries. But other places include the uh, Seattle River, the river uh, swamps, probably oxbows and that kind of backwaters of the Seattle River below Columbus the Little Miami River and Warren and Hamilton counties, the Kilbug Marsh Wetlands complex of uh, Holmes, Wayne and Coshocton counties may have the, probably the largest population of prothonotary warblers in the state. Uh, Mosquito Creek Lake, we mentioned that Trumbull County, this is home of Lloyd Marshall's uh, growing prothonotary nesting project, ever growing, um, doing very well with that. And then there's ours, uh, the Upper Cuyahoga River in Geauga County. So here's where we are, and you can see the Cuyahoga River is 100 miles long from its very uppermost headwaters in northern Geauga County, two branches that merge below Burton, and we are on uh, not too far below the confluence there on about a mile long stretch of river. And this river has a low gradient as it flows over a glacial, former glacial lake bed. That is, it's an old pre-glacial valley that's filled to a great extent by glacial outwash. The newly reestablished drainage patterns, the river has reoccupied that valley, but flows on top of you know, 100, 200 feet of glacial deposits that were for a while, um, while the, Blainage, the southward uh, flow of water was blocked, it was a lake for a while, Lake Grove as the geologists refer to it as in post-glacial times. So, um, so uh, amid the rolling topography of glacial outwash features, including cames and kettles and outwash terraces, the old lake bottom of the upper Cuyahoga River's floodplain. Um, it, most of it is in uh, swamp forest, American elm, 
uh, silver maple, green ash, and swamp white oak, interspersed with willows and button bush. And um, yeah, this population was discovered in 1947 by a, a regional naturalist by the name of Merritt Skaggs. It was first reported in the early birding journals, I think called the Red Start, that served the area. So early in my tenure with Geauga Park District as a naturalist there, I was introduced to the prothonotary warblers. My mentor, I was encouraged by uh, uh, the first naturalist for Geauga Park District, Dwayne Ferris. Um, I started putting out nest boxes in 1992. These were installed upstream and downstream of Eldon Russell Park, which you can see there uh, just left of center in the picture. Um, that had provided access to the river and prime habitat. So um, at that time, the major reference for aspiring prothonotiers, if you will, prowlers, was Lawrence Walkinshaw's groundbreaking prothonotary warbler studies in 1930s and 40s in Southwest Michigan. Walkinshaw used wooden nest boxes downsized to a dimension about two thirds out of the standard bluebird box size. The other major um, reference for uh, was uh, at that time was a nest box design using two milk cartons, one nest inside the other using parts of uh, one of them for a, a lid uh, was uh, used by Lisa Pettit and her husband Dan and brother Ken for their landmark prothonotary warbler studies in Tennessee in the uh, TBA, I think a real foot lake in Ohio's Kilbug Marsh. Now Pettit's study required a large population sample. So they had to get some cheaply made, easy to do nest boxes. So they were able to get uh, the hundreds that they needed from local dairy that donated them. Uh, and this, these are sturdy and they're, they're waterproof, but not weatherproof. I mean, they are weatherproof, but they're not predator proof. Anyway, incidentally, Lisa Pettit, who now for a number of years, she's been at the Smithsonian Bird uh, uh, Institute or whatever it's called. And she was, uh, she's been at Cuyahoga Valley National Park for some years as biologist. And last year she was promoted to the director of Cuyahoga Valley National Park. So see, it all starts with prothonotaries. Okay. Um, our nesting project was launched with the aim of increasing the prothonotary warbler population along our stretch of the, the small, relatively small stretch of the Upper Cog River in Jaga County by improving the nesting success by overcoming nesting mortality factors. Now I started off using a combination of Pettit, Milk Carton and Walkinshaw wood nest boxes. And both had the same inside dimensions of about four inches square and eight inches high, which closely matched the size of, well, that does match the, in, the inside diameter, that of a half gallon milk carton, but it also closely matches the size of a downy woodpecker uh, nest cavity, which are favored by the prothonotaries. So I quickly learned the shortcomings of milk cartons. Uh, following Pettit's methods of taping them to trees, well, falling water levels put the cartons out of reach and Cartons proved not to be predator proof as raccoons demonstrated. Uh, the wood nest boxes mounted on metal posts at the edge of the riverbank also proved difficult to access with changing water levels. So by the next year, 1993, I quit the milk cartons. Instead of mounting nest boxes on metal posts on the bank, I mounted the boxes on PVC pipes slid over metal or wooden posts. The posts were set in the river bottom to better facilitate monitoring by canoe. It was an improvement, but after get clunked in the head uh, a few times while lowering the boxes for inspection, I began the search for a more durable, lightweight alternative. And voila, we found it with a um, Metamucil jars, durable, waterproof containers, easily converted to birdhouses, and at the time in steady supply from family elders. So converting a 23 ounce Metamucil or similar plastic jar to a birdhouse is a simple matter of drilling a one and one eighth inch entrance hole, quarter inch drain hole in the bottom. One inch ventilation holes are screened with plastic embroidery uh, mesh. 
and the jars are spray painted, uh, spray painted to mimic the dead wood, mossy lichen bark of tree trunks of the swamp forest. The jar is attached to a five foot section of one and a half inch inside diameter, scheduled 40 PVC pipe with the hose clamp uh, uh, inserted through slits cut in the back of the nest jar. So to install um, the jar in the river, this uh, a 10 foot, one inch inside diameter, schedule 80, that's thick wall PVC pipe serve as the main post that is pushed into the mud bottom of the river. A 10 foot elect uh, metal electrical conduit pipe is inserted in the 10 foot PVC pipe. This rigid metal core uh, lessens the swaying that comes with an uptick in current when the river rises in major rain events. So the nest jar is on the uh, five foot pipe, on the five foot pipe, it slid over the 10 foot pipe and held in place uh, with a set screw at the preferred five foot level above water that the, uh, the warblers really like. Um, and it also with the set screw facilitates it for coming by in a canoe or kayak and lowering the jar for inspection uh, monitoring. So as the prothonotaries uh, favor the shade of the swamp tree canopy, nest jar locations are not based on a prescribed distance from each other but are chosen for shade conditions and a soft mud bottom that I can push the nest pole in. So although the birdhouses made from PVC pipes are not novel among nest pocket enthusiasts, apparently the use of fiber supplements jars was. So um, our use of Metamucil jars as birdhouses was widely referenced in a number of scientific papers and publications on prothonotary warblers. So, um, so um, yeah, as I mentioned, it wasn't uh, unique. And then uh, Dick Tuttle, who was the, just the major proponent of cavity nesting birds, he went on from <clears throat> initially bluebirds and tree swallows to prothonotary warblers and kestrels and so forth. Um, he uh, used PVC pipe and added uh, more ventilation and just, uh, improve the design. Meanwhile, uh, Lloyd Marshall over there in, at Mosquito Lake in Trumbull County picked up on what I was doing, got some commercially available jars and has had great success over there. So, um, so with the switch from wood nest boxes to plastic jars, we were concerned about the loss of the insulating properties that wood offers. Then in about 1997, Metamucil became available in the larger 36.8 ounce jar. So we tested prothonotary warbler preference by pairing the two jar sizes on mounting poles, on their mounting poles, paired them up. So for the most part, the prothonotaries chose the smaller 23 ounce jars with the three and a half inch diameter over the 36 ounce jars with their four and a quarter inch diameter. So what do we do? We use the larger jar. Why? Well, we could add uh, the extra, you take advantage of the extra space to add this 3 8 inch uh, thick pipe insulation foam we got from a plumbing supply as an inside jar line to provide temperature buffering quality that wood nest boxes afford. And the foam also provided a better toehold for nestlings to exit the nest jar at fledgling. As prothonotaries show up uh, on the Upper Cuyahoga River by May 1st, we install the nest jars before the end of April. And we can't leave the pipes in year round as the winter ice flows would uh, bend the pipes. And with that metal core, that's a permanent bend. If not, just take the pipes down underwater. So we have to pull them. And thank goodness for the warm weather this November because it wasn't until Thanksgiving Day that I got out and pulled them out this, uh, this year. Um, so let's see. So from mid-July, or early, uh, from early May to mid-July, the nest jars are monitored two to three times a week but by us prothonotiers or prowlers. Well, from uh, the mid-1990s to the late 2000s, uh, uh, 
prothon my prothonotary partner was Andy Fondrick, who handled much of his of the monitoring. And uh, my daughters, uh, Kate and Emma, when they were young, they learned to count objects by counting warbler eggs as three-year-olds. So, okay, Rachel, it's all yours. So I'm gonna pick up here and talk a bit about the birds and a bit about our data. I should note, however, that this year's numbers are, are not in this data. So this was through last summer's uh, nesting um, and banding information. So 2022 is not yet um, in this data because this capped off the 30 years. But looking at um, some of our numbers here, you can see a chart of males and females. And the number of prothonotary warblers on this stretch of river has been fairly consistent um, over the years of this study. Males slightly outnumber the females, um, as there are always males whose uh, mating st status is undetermined. We don't know who their females are or if they happen to have a female. Uh, nesting progression is that the males tend to arrive before the females. Uh, sorry, I've got a co-presenter here and my cat. Let me see if I can get her out of here. There we go. Um, males arrive before the females and the previous year's males will claim their, uh, oh, are we, okay. Yeah, we're good. We'll claim their previous territories um, with that. And they claim their territory with song. I, I don't know if you wanted to try to play that. Yeah, yeah. I know people might be familiar, but it's it's always a nice thing to hear. When we're out on the river, that makes our ears perk up. See where they might be. So the males will arrive, they inspect the um, in cavities and hopefully our nest jars. Uh, and then to attract their mates, the males will gather wads of moss and they'll make a foundation in the bottom of the cavity with that. Um, the female, if she likes it, she will then add more moss to there and, um, and, and suit it up to how she would like her nest to be. And they will then, when they're ready to lay eggs or right before they're ready to lay eggs, they will line the nest with uh, very thin strands of bark or fine rootlets of whatever they can find, even, even poison ivy uh, tendrils will be found in there. So when she is ready to lay eggs, she'll lay anywhere from four to six eggs. The average is typically five and they will hatch in about um, 10 to 12 days after she lays that last egg. When they hatch, um, they're kind of the, 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 the well, like most uh, baby uh, birds, a, a little, whatever a mother could love there, but they're only about an inch long. They're incredibly feeble, but they do grow fast as, as most of these wild creatures do. The nestlings will fledge the nest in as little as uh, nine to 10 days. So they go from being pretty feeble up to fledging in less than two weeks with that. Um, and you can see at the bottom, and they do cram into the cavities, but you can even see the progression over five days to nine days. Um, and that nine day, if we were to try to ban those, I'd be really nervous um, that they might start popping out on us. Um, so as gleaners, uh, the prothonotaries pluck a variety of invertebrates, which include caterpillars, spiders, moths, damselflies, and they'll take them right off of leaves and twigs. The annual mayfly hatch provides a feast of those uh, slow flying insects that they can just grab. They're not the only ones. We also, of course, have you know robins and cedar waxwings and any other birds that join in the flycatchers, and they will hawk insects right out of the air. That's kind of fun to watch. So the warblers are pretty vulnerable, um, as are most animals when it is nest time. So they're kind of vulnerable and, and this may surprise people, it may not surprise if you're familiar with the birds, but one of the, the biggest threats is wrens, Caroline, or, uh, house wrens, will, uh, we, we call it wren wrecking. They will dismantle these nests in no time at all. They're competitors for these nest cavities and uh, really have created much of um, our, we, we still haven't figured out how to keep them out of the nest because they're of similar size and they can get in and they're really destructive. They will remove the nest material. Uh, they might just simply build their nest on top of the already started um, prothonotary nest. 
they have been known to um, also take bird, baby birds and eggs out of nests. So they, they can go uh, really, they, they can cause a lot of trouble here. We figure that when we have uh, mysterious disappearances of eggs where we have documented eggs and then the next time we view there are no eggs, it's probably due to the house wrens throwing the, the eggs out. Um, only the most vigilant pair of prothonotary parents can succeed in deterring the wren raids. And we have watched them defending their, uh, the, the prothonotary is defending from the wrens and they have to be really vigilant about it. Um, sensing limits of their nesting season, the prothonotaries will re-nest up until about mid-June. So if, um, if, they have, or if their nest has been wrecked, they might re-nest as long as they feel like they're within the time period there. There has been an instance of three nesting attempts by a pair of prothonotaries uh, trying to succeed with wren pressure. The damage fluctuates. Uh, we have a graph here that shows the estimated egg loss attributed to house wrens. Uh, some years aren't so bad and other years it's just devastating uh, to what they have can pull out. Over 30 years, we've lost about 20% of the prothonotary eggs to house wrens. And as I mentioned before, we have not yet found an effective way to deter them since they really can get into the same size hole cavity. Dan will talk later about how we can keep some larger birds out. Back to these young, uh, <laughs> there's, there's one, they're, they're, they're in the cute stage. I, I like the, the fluff on the heads there. They're banded at about one week old. So right about seven days is ideal. We used a size zero aluminum band from the USGS Bird Banding Lab and have some special banding pliers to get those on the legs. If you need or, more explanation on that, you can go to the Bird Banding Lab website or ask us after. Uh, but seven days old is ideal because by that time, their leg tissue has gone from kind of thick and fleshy to a little bit more firm and more thin. So the band can move freely on the leg without getting constricted and we can get it to seal uh, tightly as it should so that it, it's not crimping their leg and it's able to move up and down on the leg. Um, for the babies, for the fledglings, we put the bands on the right leg and that's that's their silver bling. And then we can pretty we can tell pretty quickly if it's a returning bird, if we see this USGS band on the right leg, it means that we have already banded this bird as a as a baby. So since 1992, we have banded over 700 uh, prothonotary nestlings. Of that number, less than 3% have returned to this project area as adults. Um, so they have a really high, as, as many songbirds do, first year mor mortality is really high. Um, and also they, as a young yearling bird that we suspect that they are filling in other vacancies that they find uh, during their migration and holes in other populations where they might just be living outside of, of our boundary area that we monitor. So it could be due to mortality, or it could be that they've settled into other areas. So um, after they have fledged, their parents continue to uh, tend to them for a couple of weeks. Male prothonotaries, um, territorial singing will wane in about uh, July. And what you tend to hear moving up and down, instead of hearing that sweet, sweet, sweet song, we're hearing the incessant calls from these fledglings to say, feed me, feed me. And they are um, pretty noisy about it too. And it's uh, entertaining because they're pretty much the same size as the adults. And as, as you've seen with many baby birds and the parents are tending them very diligently to feed them. Second broods for prothonotaries are not considered common for the northern latitudes of their range. But uh, if the first season or if the first nesting is completed soon enough, they will um, start a second nest and, and be successful in that. Uh, in these cases, the male tends to the fledged young while the female is incubating her new clutch. In other cases, the prothonotaries might change mates for the second go around. They might not stay with the same pairing. Um, but guaranteed before mid-September, the last of the prothonotaries have uh, started on their migration and have left for the uh, tropics. 
So we've talked about babies. Let's talk a little bit about more threats other than just the wren. By placing the nest jars in the shade of the swamp forest trees um, and avoiding overhanging low branches, we have virtually eliminated predation by raccoons. Raccoons are very abundant. And, um, but if you place the nests carefully, you can keep them pretty much out of the way so that they're not accessing the nest through low hanging branches. The occasional disappearance of nestlings in an otherwise intact prothonotary nest is still mystifying. Although we haven't witnessed it, uh, wrens, you know, as I mentioned, as part of their hostile takeover may remove hatchlings in addition to eggs. So they're not really picky at what they're gonna throw out of there. We've never, um, I've never seen, I don't think Dan has record of it either, of the northern water snakes uh, scaling into the nest pole jars. And then uh, yet to be witnessed, but also um, causing a bit of suspicion with single nestling and egg disappearances are woodpecker raids. Turns out that there's a documentation of egg and nestling predation that reveal red-bellied woodpeckers as under the radar nest pred predators. Um, they'll perch at the entrance of the hole um, eggs and nestlings, um, well, can be harpooned uh, in, with the woodpecker's tongue. And I think we have, a, oh, yep, there, there's a photo of a red belly being caught in the act of taking out a pileated woodpecker egg. Uh, we have not experienced egg removal and replacement by the nest parasitiz parasitizing brown-headed cowbird. A cowbird was what was once witnessed looking in to enter a nest jar, but flew on uh, probably we, we hope and suspect that it thought the opening was too small to get in and out. So um, with vigilance, we've been able to avoid flood losses. So when we're talking about predators of the animal kind, we also have the threat on, along the stretch of rivers that it rises um, and falls. It is, it is relatively flat, but it can still rise several feet. So with these major rain events, um, the set screws and the poles are underwater and you can add, we can add extensions to the BVC pipes to raise the nest jars uh, out of the water's way until the waters recede. So one of the questions we get asked a lot is have we increased the prothonotary population with the nest jars in this stretch of the upper Cuyahoga? And it's not really clear and we don't claim that we have but we do contend that we have uh, improved the nesting success of the birds that are there. So um, by helping overcome nest mortality, uh, predation, flooding, and uh, cowbird parasitization, par yeah, parasitism. So um, I think in the 30 years of this study, the numbers I have, again, this does not include this past season, but there have been 246 nestlings, nestlings, yeah, that produced 1,344 eggs with a hatch rate of 60%. Um, that takes into account the unhatched and the predated eggs. So the nest jars have fledged 759 warblers with uh, from 803 hatched eggs, giving a fledgling rate of the eggs on this um, in this study of about 94%. So I think Dan, you're gonna take over and talk about- Yeah, talk about tree swallows. Right. Those beautiful iridescent blue-green aquamarine blue birds with the dazzling white undersides that are um, were serious nest competitors. Um, they, even though we downsized the entrance holes to one and one eighth inch to uh, prevent their entry, some of them did would still squeeze in. And they would have a hard time putting nesting material in there. So with minimal amount of nesting material, they would lay their eggs in there. And then when you go to monitor the nest, you know, and moving the pole up and down, you would hear those eggs roll around like marbles in a spray paint can. I mean, it was, uh, and, but they somehow managed. So um, we tried a number of things to, I mean, we, we love tree swallows, don't get us wrong, but um, we tried various schemes to uh, eliminate this. So um, we, once, uh, we once even had a tree swallow take over prothonotary warbler nest after the warbler laid uh, one egg, in her first egg. So before she could complete her clutch, tree swallows, took over. 
Well, we left it'll be to see how it would turn out. The swallows hatched and fed the warbler nestling, but the swallow nestling soon overtook the warbler babe in size, got all the food, and probably the food was not so much caterpillars, probably not any caterpillars, but probably all flying insects. So the diet didn't match. It didn't make it, but it was uh, curious to see what would happen. Anyway, that's a digression there. So what did we do? We tried uh, to promote cohabitation with these double-decker Cuyahoga cavity condos. Well, they worked once or twice in housing both species, but usually only tree swallows on top. And the setup was also very cumbersome and top heavy and very difficult to monitor the upper deck. So um, we kept looking for a better way. So by way of exclusion, we found that all but the most determined swallows are kept out of the nest jars by adding the second entrance hole placed over but offset from the first creating a slight elliptical that prothonotaries could easily negotiate, but swallows couldn't. So there's two methods for making this offset elliptical. One was to um, simply glue a, a plate made from another plastic jar, or to add even additional overall protection by surrounding the jar with a section of four inch thin wall PVC pipe, which really made them bulletproof, literally. So with the uh, new, uh, the new economy size 48 ounce Metamucil jar that became available, we found the best solution to date by placing the larger nest jars with larger entrance holes in sunny spots as the warblers prefer shade. Uh, the tree swallows readily used them and left the prothonotary nest jars alone. Well, our trials were not over. We had um, a rare but horrific problem that we encountered especially with tree swallows, not too many, but still unacceptable number, and, and only two, but that was two too many prothonotaries, was the inexplicable and fatal attempts to enter the top of the mounting pole. Now you think, well, just stuff something in it. Well, yeah, except that when you lower the nest jar to uh, on the set screw, where one pole slides over the other, it would pop out, any, the inner pipe would pop out anything you put in there. So we contemplated and uh, uh, Rachel and another good friend of ours and I kind of struck on an idea here um, that uh, we devised this by taking a coupling for PVC pipe and we put in four strands of, um, what you call them, weed whipper or uh, uh, power trimmer cord uh, cross each other over the center of the pipe. And uh, that kept the birds from going down. And there you are. But that would give way when you lowered the pipe to uh, investigate or monitor the jars. And then when you raise the jars back up, the, uh, the uh, plastic strips would just fall back into place. Yeah, and that's Eddie. Eddie is... Uh, He's got to he stick his nose in every nest jar. So, um, all right. Okay. Uh, yeah, Rachel, I think here's where you take over again. Sure. Um, so, uh, is this? No, oh, here we are. So, in 1996, um, we already showed you the, the banding of the fledglings, they get the USGS ban. But in 1996, we started uh, capturing the adults and giving them, in addition to the USGS ban, um, some color bands so that we can hopefully from year to year recognize individuals that come back. One color is used on the left leg and that is for all the birds in a given year. So they would all have the same color on the left and then a, a different color on the right to, to determine the individual uh, identification. Uh, and that way we don't have to keep capturing them. And I, I can't even read those USGS bands when they're right in front of my face. So there's no way I'm catching them on a binocular, but the color bands for the most part, um, if the colors don't fade too badly, you can see them on site just by looking. So um, to capture the females, there we go. 
Um, we have used a mesh laundry bag to capture them when they're incubating in the jar. So the best shot at them is when they are sitting on the nest. And this requires quite a stealthy approach, um, being careful not to hit the canoe on the jar and disturb her. Sometimes she even hears us coming and, and then you're just sort of shot. But uh, before reaching the jar, either Dan or I, who are, whoever's in the front, would uh, kind of cover that jar with the mesh bag as quickly as you could. And um, most of the time, she flushes right out of the jar and into the bag. Um, and then the, everything's carefully lowered so that you can extract her. However, sometimes, oh yes, they're standing in the canoe, which I always tell kids do not stand in the canoe, but uh, there we go. And sometimes though, she will sit tight on that nest and you can do all the disturbing you want and, and she's still sitting on there. So we kind of have to prod her out or, or just take the whole jar off and, and, and uh, kind of ask her to come out of there. With the bird in hand, um, we get all the bird bling on their legs and then Dan takes a photo and has a catalog of all the birds photographed from year to year. Uh, capturing, oh, sorry. Has, was that to 2021? Uh, we have about 100 banded females that we've captured. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. The males, then this might seem involved, but the males are even a little bit more involved because you have to go out, um, locate where they're singing on territory, find a good spot to set up a mist net, and we string it between two poles in a spot that's free of any interfering branches, but it has, um, it can, you know, that it still could be invisible behind a leafy background, plus shade. You don't want sun reflecting on it because then the, the, mist net is visible. Um, and also then, in addition to finding the perfect nest site uh, for human safety, avoiding the ever abundant poison ivy that can grow as, you know, grow as tall as trees in, in the swamp forest. So um, taking all that into account, we set the nest. And there in the left-hand picture is a real bird caught in the nest. And the one with its feet up is our decoy. Um, He's not usually on the ground like that, but we'll place the decoy in the tree near to where we can play a song uh, via a Bluetooth recorder. And they, the male uh, pretty much fold every time, wants to know who's on his territory. In he comes, we're hoping he sees the decoy as a threat to his territory, charges after him and into the net. That's the ideal situation. That. Yeah, Rachel, we probably should say that the decoy is not a live bird. <laughs> oh, well, I, I was hoping that was implied, but yes, with the legs up there, the, the decoy, it's a plastic bird that is well painted to look like the real thing. Um, so no, it is not a, a live bird or a stuffed bird um, with that. So while we've banded about 100 females, there's, um, oh, sorry, they get their same bird bling there with the colored bands and the USGS band. Uh, up to 2021, we have banded 106 males. And I know that's gone up this year uh, just by a, a few birds too. They are also photographed and then released unharmed. Uh, with the ability now to identify year, birds from year to year, uh, much has been re revealed about breeding biology. Uh, first of all, we can talk about longevity, at least within our study site. With all the hazards of long distance migration and the life, expen the life expen expectancy of small neotropical songbird is about two years. So it's, it's not terribly long. So in a given year, um, a half or more of the adult birds return from the previous year. So with the color bands, we know when, what year they were banded and we can see where they have been at on our territory in the past or on our study site in the past. The number gets increasingly smaller as you go to the second year. Um, the oldest bird banded as an adult that returned uh, for eight years following his banding year. So that's making that bird at least nine years old. That's assuming that he would have been banded the, in his first year and there's no, we don't, we don't know if that to be the case. So he was at least a nine-year-old bird uh, before he stopped coming. We might add that we got our second nine-year-old bird uh, this past uh, uh, nesting season, uh, female. 
I was going to say that that was one of our females. Yeah. So this was a male and now we've had a nine year old uh, female again, at least nine year, assuming she was banded in her first year, which again, we don't know. Um, so we can talk about longevity, but we can also talk about nest site faithfulness, Ma multi-year males. So those are the birds that return for more than one year tend to return to the previous territory that they had in the past. Uh, Multi-year females, however, the much less discriminatory, they, they will be found on other territories. Examples of multi-year pair bonding uh, have been documented, more so in the first decade of this study, with females displaying less nest site faithfulness compared to the returning multi-year males. Pairs having multi-year matings are generally limited to two to three year pair bondings. A remarkable exception was uh, a female prothonotary that nested in the same general area upstream from Eldon Russell Park from 1996 to 2002, making her at least a seven year bird. She had the same mate for four consecutive nesting seasons, succeeded by another male for her remaining three years. When she didn't show up in the May of, of, May of two, 2002, her mate paired and nested with another female. However, in early June, she showed up late. Um, her male nonetheless took up with her and took on double nesting duty. She laid a clutch of five eggs. Um, unfortunately, she was not seen again after mid-June and two dead nestlings were found in her nest jar. So there's a, a story of what could have unfolded there. Male polygamy does occur among this uh, studied population of prothonotaries. And we define polygamy to um, be a male prothonotary having two female, nest, um, female mates nesting simultaneously in his territory or sometimes in disjunct territories. The standout example is a male that uh, we'll just call Buzz. He was distinguished uh, as much by his song as by his uh, bling because he buzzed uh, at the end of his uh, call. In 1998, he had nests going with three females at the same time. Unfortunately, his territorial attention was too divided to cover all uh, the guarded duties that he had to do with all these uh, nests and wrens destroyed all of the egg clutches. Um, so this is a demonstrated example of how uh, this uh, polygamy can be a disadvantage when wren, especially when wren pressure is heavy. In the past several years, our prothonotaries river habitat has undergone change. Um, the upper Cuyahoga Valley with its low gradient never turns in, it never runs fast. It's never raging torrent, but it can rise um, as much as four to five feet on extreme, extreme rainfalls. Major rain events in May have increased significantly since uh, 2015. And although we are able to keep nest jars out of harm's way, the prothonotaries have reacted to ever more frequent high water levels in a way that has hampered our ability to see the nests. In other words, they don't like to use our jars as much. So in years past, when the river waters were within the banks or even just briefly out of the banks in the spring, um, prothonotaries would, um, oh, sorry, there we go. I, I skipped a, a line there, but they, preferred our nest jars over the natural available cavities that were there. But with the increased water flooding now happening um, in more recent years, the prothonotaries themselves have responded by moving back away from the main river channel uh, to take advantage of the ex extended swamp habitat that's available. And our nest jars are not in that expanded swamp habitat uh, for the most part. So they're selecting more um, of the natural cavities and they, and they have more places to look when they are looking for nests because the river has been high in um, more, re more frequently in um, recent years. So with these prolonged episodes of high water, in addition to expanding their nesting area within you know, the small range of our study site, it's also um, caused some major tree die off. So even though the swamp forest is comprised of wetland tree species, there's also such a thing as too wet. The uh, silver maple, which is the dominant tree species of the swamp forest, has died off in large numbers. Subdominant trees are also stressed. Um, 
and are being inundated while also being assailed by other pathogens. You know, the American elm uh, can succumb to Dutch elm disease and the ash has been decimated by the emerald ash borer. So with so much standing dead timber at the edge of the river, uh, we think in addition to having increased swamp area due to flooding, they also have increased natural cavities due to more tree die off and um, they have just uh, uh, more shade. There's less shade close to where their nesting used to happen and they can go back deeper into the swamp to get the shade, the flooded swamp, I should say. Um, another effect of tree die off uh, is the more sunlight reaching the swamp forest floor resulting in heavier undergrowth. And that is a much more inviting habitat to our um, nest disrupting house wrens. So uh, the rest, the wrens take full, ex full advantage of the unoccupied nest jars that we put out uh, for the prothonotaries. Away from the main channel, I already mentioned the prothonotaries have returned to their traditional natural cavity situations. These include the knot holes, uh, former woodpecker cavities, broken snags, and all of which are now much more abundant. The dead timber has attracted increasing numbers of nesting woodpeckers, including downy, hairy, pileated woodpeckers, northern flickers, and recently, uh, past couple years consistently, yellow-bellied sapsuckers that use the willows uh, for sap wells. Vacated woodpecker cavities provide increased housing opportunities for these uh, prothonotaries um, as secondary ca cavity nesters. So opting for these natural cavities, uh, they now are more susceptible to floods and um, predators, which we were able to uh, protect them from in the nest jars. So not being in the nest jars, they're now more vulnerable to some of these um, issues that, that would come harm's way. Um, coincidentally, the last several years uh, has also, particularly since uh, people have been outdoors a lot more with COVID and moving around, we've seen a tremendous increase. Even prior to COVID, there was a tremendous increase in canoe and kayak traffic out of Eldon Russell Park. It's, it's one of the, the river put-ins. And it has really increased the human presence which brings with it noise and radios and commotion. Uh, but luckily, most of this activity begins after the prothonotaries have already settled into their nest sites. And the birds themselves have re really shown remarkable resilience to this um, people in flux and, and they're, they're really tolerant of, of the presence. It, it, it hasn't seemed to cause them to move back. We haven't noticed any people pressures that have influenced their activities. Uh, vandalism, you know, with more human activity, vandalism might be a concern, but really it's been virtually non-existent over the years. Um, most of what we get is just a whole lot of curiosity and, and a lot of interpreting as to, hey, what are those? Hey, what are you doing? Hey, why are you tromping through the poison ivy? Um, hey, what, you know, so just a lot of opportunity to interpret information for, for people passing by on the river. I think Dan's going to talk about the future and yeah. uh, the project now. And uh, explain prothonotaries to the uh, armadas of, of boaters there has been very gratifying because the people are just think that's really great that we're doing that. And, um, you know, we, we are pondering the future. This past season, the 2020 season was our first one where we, you know, we, thought well, okay 30 years let's let's just shut it down we see where this is going um but for a number of reasons well let's continue but on a scaled back operation we've done 30 years we've shown some trends and so forth and um i think we've proven the point that as rachel explained with uh the prime nesting areas right along the river that could be easily accessed by boat our you know, birds have moved further in the forest. It's just um, limited, very much limited our nesting, uh, nest monitoring opportunities. So this year we put out 10 jars and those four of those were uh, for tree swallows paired with prothonotary jars. And uh, following Dick Tuttle's, um, his, uh, uh, 
he uh, contends his contention that uh, the tree swallows will help keep the wrens away. Um, and since we've pretty much eliminated the the competition tree swallows and warblers, we decided to give this more of a try. So we did um, in one section we paired four warbler jars with four tree swallow jars, and then just had um, two other warbler jars. Um, and one one of the most our best spots is remarkably directly across from the launch and landing spot at Eldon Russell Park, where all the the noisiest and the most commotion is concentrated commotion. And there's just this little tiny cove directly across from the landing. And that's been one of our most consistent and successful uh, spots for uh, getting uh, nesting protonotaries. So we've stuck with that. And we had, um, so we had really six nest jars for warblers and we had warbler uh, nests in, um, in three of them. So uh, that was, again, we were going for a section that was kind of the last stronghold where the wrens haven't uh, exacted their, their worst uh, damage uh, to date. So that was probably part of it too. So, um, you know, there are probably at least as many prothonotaries as ever. We also look at, you know, uh, even though we're not getting them in our nest jars, we're still monitoring the population in banding males. And, uh, you know, the in the natural cavity, you're lucky if you can find it, never mind, reach it to uh, see how, and then trying to find out how many eggs, how many young, you know, how many hatched, how many fledged. It's just impossible. And we don't really want to, leave a scent trail for raccoons either. So that is one of the situations that we've come to our determination to how to proceed. And um, so uh, we did, I guess I should admit that, you know, in our three uh, prothonotary nest jar nests that we had this year, one was in a tree swallow jar while the tree swallows went in the warbler jar. So, <laughs> you know, so it goes, but anyway. Um, so with this, um, well, one might ask, well, well, why don't you just, why don't you just go with it and put the, get out of the, the boats and get out into the swamp forest and put the, put the posts in there with the nest jars. Well, for one thing, there's poison ivy growing on like every tree there. And I'm allergic to it <laughs> for one thing. And, uh, and then the mud, you know, after you've had, when the water recedes, first of all, you're, you know, water can be very high, even when it recedes, you know, the mud will still suck the boots right off your feet. And Rachel can tell you, I've been out there with my boots left in the mud and I'm walking around my stock and feet in mud. And, you know, monitoring that could have been done in two and three hours traditionally became and would become an all day ordeal. So that was out. So um, with this proliferation and, and the number of house wren nests with, uh, with the nest jars left unused uh, by the warblers, we're getting more and more house wrens. So we're, we're end up raising more enemy than we are the intended target species. So we did, um, we, that led to our decision to cut back. So um, we again are still um, still netting and banding males with hopes that whoops I hit that with hopes that um, we someday may be able to use geolocators as with our record of uh, returning birds year to year showing that well, this might be a good bet of putting geolocators, especially if you need to recapture them or, or the, simply the birds returning back to be able to collect data from the geolocators. So we're we're get, accumulating a good track record. Might, and then that with the addition of adding more modus towers in the region to pick up these birds, the signals from the geolocators, uh, we might um, have uh, well, that, that in itself might be a good reason to keep this going on some uh, lower uh, level. So um, I guess the, uh, you know, the other thing is, is 
the other incentive for continuation of our efforts with prothonotary warblers is to continue to foster this. This, this bird is like the pro poster child, if you will, uh, ambassador for wildlife and wetland preservation. You couldn't get a more flashy, brilliant bird. And you'll see it featured on a lot of posters and so forth like that, whether it's about the prothonotary specifically or near tropical birds or wetland wildlife. And often, more often than not, that'll feature a prothonotary warbler. So with this luminescent presence on display to impress people, and, and let me tell you, being out there, you know, that we've had anglers and walkers, hikers, dog walkers, you know, when you tell them, when they ask you what you're doing and you explain to them, I saw one of those, oh my gosh, you know, uh, the birds really make an impression. So the upper Cuyahoga, it's a state, our section is a state designated scenic river and it's a haven for dozens of breeding bird species. We figured that you could potentially get 70 species of, on a breeding bird survey. Um, and there, it's a haven for, uh, we've got bald eagles, osprey, sandhill cranes nest in the wetlands that down along our stretch of river, muskrats, mink, otters, and many rare and colorful dragonflies and damselflies. These are all providing watchable wildlife opportunities for people. And you got a prothonotary, it's a relatively tame bird. You know, it's not like typical war, you get war birders, you recognize the, the affliction of warbler neck from looking at treetop warblers for minutes on end. Well, these birds are, you know, you can drift right up to them sometimes. And so they're not, they are not shy. And that again, makes watchable wildlife. And, you know, this is making an impressionable memorable experiences on people. So hopefully that'll lead to greater appreciation, not only for wildlife, but for wetlands is a valuable wildlife habitat. So by extension, more support for wildlife conservation using these birds as ambassadors. So what can we, like the Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society and uh, do to, for prothonotary warblers? Well, you can put more nest boxes in swamps. Yeah, but just like bluebirds, you gotta monitor them, but again, you know, really true swamp habitat that these would attract these birds. It's, it's not, not that much. So, but the habitat protection comes first. So we urge uh, all of these conservation and birding organizations to unite with each other to form a strengthened coalition to advance wildlife conservation issues uh, as they arise. And you know, we all have our, these separate organizations and they all have their memberships and they function well as small entities. But what needs to happen to really make a difference in wildlife for bird conservation is to be able to come together, to band together in times of need to promote conservation legislation to, and you know, an example would be the Sherwin Williams building recently that Curtin Bird Club and, and uh, probably, you know, all the others here have been working in that those kind of issues provide the opportunity to have a real show of force to bring these different uh, organizations together to protect the resource that uh, that they're all in it for. Uh, anyway, so, okay, I'll get off the soapbox and um, like to uh, roll the credits here with our Prothonotiers over the years, Andy Fondrick, Ann Baguetta, and Rachel. And uh, leave that up for a few seconds there. You see, yeah, it's a number of people that uh, different organizations and have lent their support and not necessarily monetary support. This is really a low budget project, but, um, but have, uh, you know, provided either some publicity or acknowledge the, how it serves their uh, various missions and so forth like that when it comes to water quality and conservation. So, yeah. Okay, that's it. That's the end. Uh, wow. You can, wow. Uh, Dan, Rachel, fabulous. Um, 
shoot, I don't know what to say. Fabulous. Um, if you wouldn't mind, stop screen sharing, then we can see everybody, hopefully. And uh, we'll open it up to questions. Uh, I don't know if there's any questions in the chat. Let me see. There we go. Uh, yep, I, I, lots of thank yous, but again, you can unmute now. And if you have a question, please, uh, we'll, we'll entertain a couple of questions. No questions. No questions. I guess we, everybody fell asleep. Um, <laughs> we're toddled <laughs> off to bed. <laughs> I, I don't think anybody fell asleep. Oh, Paula, did you have something? No, no I was just coughing. So oh. I haven't felt well, so I'm not putting on my video, but this has been an amazing review of everything. Thank you so much, Dan, for everything you've done over the years. And Rachel, yeah. yeah. Rachel, too. And all, yes. all the other, everyone else. Yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting that that you covered, you know, the the the, the progress, and then of course things that aren't so good, like you know, with the with the house wrens, and then the 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 water levels and the trees dying, but providing natural cavities, and oh my goodness, there's just a ton to think about and and review and look at, and it just wow. <laughs> Well, yeah, I think, you know, hanging in there as long as we have, we were able to document the habitat change that uh, took place. And, and in fact, not so much on, you know, at least for now, we'll see what the future brings. It's still good habitat. And we still have uh, a full complement of protonotary warblers, but um, it's, it's, we now have, we may lose other birds, you know, cerulean warblers have become more chancy. You know, we have less of the uh, big mature trees along the river. Um, on the other hand, you know, this past year, we, we now, as of this past year, have all seven Ohio woodpeckers nesting in our stretch of river. We added redheaded woodpecker this year. Um, and uh, there are some birds that we may not see that have been getting, um, you know, I mentioned Cerulean Warbler, but like least flycatcher is not a consistent one from year to year. So they like the understory the, um, of the younger growth woods there, the open understory. And that open understory is not there so much anymore. So yep. we're able to document these things. And by, you know, still work in the same area in a, in a, um, in a more modest approach, we're still there to document those kind of changes. So. Wonderful. Well, uh, however you progress into the future with fewer boxes, different styles, whatever, don't get poison ivy. It's it's <laughs> terrible. But um, you know, we hope that you can continue on. I don't know if if you have additional volunteers, younger people coming into the realms of. I don't know, Rachel. That like may this. be uh, something we have to think more about. As long as I can still load a canoe up top on my truck, I guess. So. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. All righty. Well, we thank you, everyone. And thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. Have a wonderful holiday. And please check out the website. Check out our Christmas bird count information and maybe join us on Monday for that kickoff so that you get excited about getting out and doing our helping with our count circle on uh, December 30th. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, well, Rachel. Thank you, uh, Nancy, for being a everyone, fine host. And yes. Uh, yes, and thank you for being a fine audience. It's our pleasure. Yeah, everyone have a great evening. Thank you. Good night.